stand up um, and get comfortable. And uh, I'll, I'll pass it over to our lovely old Sweeney. Okay, our couch is full. Everyone get comfy, we're about to start. I'm so excited. Okay, just by a show of hands, was anyone here for our last two MM Talk sessions? Anyone in this room? That's one person. I was here as well. Okay, the MM team. Of course you guys were here. You was here? Yeah, you were. Okay, great. Well, welcome to MM Talks. Um, I'm so happy that you guys can be here, and I'm so glad um, that Mixtape Madness can do these talks and give you the insight you need and the knowledge that you're searching for and that we get to speak to great people in the industry who have done great things. I'm so excited to speak to every one of you. Um, we're going to start with Alex. Hi. Um, <laughs> and just so you know, I'm Sweeney and I'm your host for tonight. So let's get started. So Alex, if you just want to introduce yourself to everyone, just keep it brief. Hi guys, so I'm Alex. I run the operations at Kiki, uh, and this is Kiki. So we are a new on-demand streaming platform uh, for long-form audio content, so that's podcasts, radio shows, mixes. We're pre-launch, so we're launching kind of three months, but we're kind of trying to change the way people discover new music, and we're going to support artists in a way that, that people aren't doing at the moment. That's our plan. That's great, and I must say that the Kiki Studios is so lovely. It looks very nice in here. And um, I just want to ask, particularly about Kiki Studios, how did that sort of uh, idea begin? What was the concept behind Kiki Studios? What are you trying to promote? Yeah. So there's a, there's a number of stories, I guess, as to why we, why we started, why we launched. I think maybe the easiest one to understand is the fact that kind of 12 to 18 months ago, there was a boom at Netflix. Everyone was kind of using Netflix, and it was this high quality, curated like video platform. Um, and it was doing really, really well. And so when we looked at the audio world, there wasn't something like this. You know, there's, how many of you guys use SoundCloud and Mixcloud? I guess all, all of you. So the issues with those platforms, there's a lot of issues with those platforms, but essentially there's a lot of rubbish on there, right? <laughs> and so, yeah. And so from, uh, and that's not dissing you guys, because I'm sure your stuff is great. Um, but if, as a user, if you want to find the good stuff, you've got to trawl through the bad stuff to find it. What Netflix did really well is it was, everything on there was great. It's legacy content. It's high quality. So we thought there's a gap in the market here for something that's a high quality, long form audio content platform. Um, and that's, that's kind of, I think that's the best reason or the best way to describe why we've launched. Um, right. Yeah. So why do you think that having a platform such as Kiki Studios, is important in music today? So I think there's, there's two ways to think about it. One is from a, a user perspective. So like I said, there isn't that high quality, in-depth audio platform out there at the moment. And people want more. You know, the growth of podcasting has been almost exponential, right. in particular between like the 16 to 24 year olds. So we know these people want to learn more about their artists, like they want more information about the artists. Um, they want to be closer to their artists. Like, I think social media has done a good job in terms of dragging people in, but that's like really short form still. And now people want to know in-depth information about their artists. And so that's why I think it's important for users in particular. Mm. And then I think from an artist's perspective, there's, there's many benefits. I think we create a bit of an ecosystem for our artists and we support them properly in the sense that if you come and work with Kiki, you can use our studios to create the content. We have an amazing design team who will brand and package your content for you, so your content looks and feels better than anything else out there. And then we monetize your content for you as well. So I think something that's lacking in the current ecosystem is if you put your music on Spotify or YouTube, you're not compensated fairly for that. So therefore you can't grow as an artist, you can't invest in yourself and you can't develop. And so Kiki, you know, you're not going to earn millions of pounds to us, but you'll earn something that's 10 times more than it is on YouTube. And then you can reinvest and you can grow as an artist. Right. So they're the key things. And, and I want to ask, how important is it uh, for artists that they are aware of platforms like Kiki and 
and are just aware of how they can use technology to further themselves. Yeah, so important. And even if it's for, if it's not to work with platforms like Kiki directly, even if it's to use as a sounding board, I think everyone here who, who we employ is kind of an expert in their field or their genre, and they're all happy to give people time, whether that's an artist or a producer or a videographer, you know, like use us as a sounding board. Like, don't be afraid to approach companies that you, you know, you don't necessarily know. Like, we will help. Um, and then what was your second, second part? Um, and technology. Yes, so um, how important is it that artists know that they can further themselves with uh, platforms like yourself? Yeah, so, so, so very, very important. And I think on the technology, technology angle, so there's more and more tech available now for artists to use. Even platforms like Amuse, which is a new um, kind of in-your-pocket label. It's an app. Um, I think Will I Am's kind of one of the founders. Um, and even kind of just like familiarizing yourself with platforms like that. And those platforms will give you an opportunity to get your music out there much, eas much more easily. And then if you gain traction, so for example, there's a company called United Masters, and they're kind of a label slash distribution, label services type company. If you put your music out through United Masters and it starts to pick up traction, then they will invest in you and they will take you on that journey with them. So I think just being familiar with these sorts of like, bits of tech is really, really important. And also, like, I'm quite passionate about data and using your data properly to kind of inform your marketing decisions and your release strategies. And there's so much data out there, whether that be through, through Spotify or Apple Music or your social media platforms, like use that information. I think that's really important. Like, there's so much data available to each and every one of you. It's important that you kind of just sit, look at that. And I know it's boring for an artist to do that, but if you want to break through, I think that's one of the, the like, key take homes from this talk should be, like you have access to a lot of information, like use it and grow. Alex, what does the future of Kiki Studios look like? World domination. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> so I think, uh, the future, so we want to be, we don't just want to be a new streaming platform. We want to be a new streaming platform, a new label, a new way that people consume content, um, a new way for people to discover music. Um, and that's actually a key point that I missed out is that we feel like that true lateral music discovery has disappeared. So for example, oh, are you going to say something? I agree. Oh, okay, cool. <clears throat> and so essentially, an example is on Spotify, right? Mm. If you're listening to like H, Koji Radical, Shailingo, you're going to get fed more UK artists like Octavian uh, and people like that. And so that's great is you're discovering new artists within the same genre, but you're not discovering new music like you used to. Like when you went crate digging, there was no, nothing stopping you from switching genres. Um, and you might like other genres based on like, the sonic makeup of the song or something like that. And so that's important for us at Kiki is we want to reintroduce that true music discovery, whether it be new genres, new artists. Um, like, yeah, we want to remove those boundaries that we feel like Spotify have put in place. So I think those, those things are key for Kiki going forward. That's great. Um, how are you catering to artists, specifically uh, emerging artists um, in terms of marketing and you know just helping them along the way yeah so th there's a number of things we do so the fact that we're curated means that we have this high quality barrier so f first there is a barrier to entry with us you know we would have to either come and find you or if you submitted some stuff to us it'd be like a vetting process <clears throat> but I think once you get through that process there's a number of things we do to support you so firstly is the fact that you can you know, use this space to launch live podcasts or launch EPs or small projects. Like it's a beautiful space, we don't hire it out, but if you're working with us, you can use it as an asset. We also have the studio. So the studio you can use to record that content, optimize that content. Then there's a design team that I mentioned as well, and they will design, brand, and package your shows, so it looks and feels like better than anything else. And then in terms of marketing, <clears throat> again, it's heavily kind of data-driven in the sense that we collect all the, all the information about your show that you would see on kind of your socials, but we can also provide more in-depth reports in the sense that we can provide you with brand recommendations based on the brands your audience are interested in, kind of touring information based on, again, where your audience are based. We can provide you with recommendations in terms of collaborations. So if we know that your audience are also in interested in, so if you're creating a podcast, if we know your audience, audience are interested in like the Halfcast podcast as well, we can maybe recommend some collaborations there. And we're building a network to then take it a step further to say, like, here's Chucky from like, Halfcast, so like, we can connect as well. 
That's great. And um, I just want you to let everybody know where they can sort of find um, Kiki Studios, how they can get in contact with Kiki Studios. Yeah, so kiki.co.uk is our web platform. So it's important to note that we're pre-launch. So we launch in three to six months. So essentially what we did is we built a platform really, really quickly as a proof of concept to raise a little bit of money to fund the project. We've now done that, and then we'll launch the full web platform and the app in three to six months. So we do upload 20 hours of content to this beta product, um, and it's really, really good content. Um, but take what you see with a pinch of salt and check in again in three months. But I guess if you want to work with us, hit us through the gram, which Ashley manages the Instagram. Um, that's probably the easiest way to find us at the moment. Um, and if you want more information as an artist or a creator, go to kiki.com. So kiki.co.uk is that user-facing. Kiki.com, as an artist, you'll find out some more information. And you'll also find some email addresses at the bottom to hit us up. That's really exciting. Um, Alex, I just want to thank you so much for you. opening yourselves up to us and speaking to us. Um, does anybody in the audience have a question at all for Alex? Yes. Oh, I might just give you my mic. Um, I was going to say, what's the hardest thing you anticipate? Um, so for when you're launching, what's the hardest thing you anticipate in terms of prizing um, artists or content creators? Like, what, what, do you, what do you envisage the hardest thing being? Yeah, so I think, <clears throat> so at the moment, the hardest thing is the fact that we haven't launched. So we haven't got that massive audience that SoundCloud, SoundCloud has built, basically. So that's very tricky at the moment. I think when we launch, um, to be honest, I think the product will sell itself. The product looks amazing, and so anyone working with us can, can kind of see what we're building, and it looks amazing, and that will really sell itself. Um, so I think once people start using it, they'll, they'll kind of come over to us. So I don't see any, any issues going forward, but definitely at the moment we have issues in terms of we're, we're pre-launch, so we're kind of selling the dream, if you like. Um, but yeah, going forward, I think the product will speak for itself. And just to clarify, you're, you're London-based, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Okay, all right. Cool. Me, me or Kiki? Kiki. So, okay, so we're based in London, but we're a global platform. Okay. Um, in the sense that when we launch, we'll look to launch globally, so Latin America, Asia, key markets for us, um, Africa, West Africa. Um, and we also have, so we have access to studios in Asia, we have access to studios in the US. So, yeah, although we're London-based, like, we'll definitely be launching globally. Um, that's really, really important. Um, and that's important, I guess. So does anyone know where the most Spotify streams come from? Like which city the most Spotify streams come from, apart from Ash? And yeah, me. <laughs> <laughs> no. Okay, so it's Mexico City. Okay. And so in terms of like breaking artists, it's important that we have that global presence so we can break artists globally as well. Um, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, man. I thank you. Yeah. So say an emerging artist came to you, what does Kiki get out of helping that emerging artist? Yeah, so if you're, if you're super talented, um, then we want to help you grow. So we want to bring on people that are like Octavian two years ago, right? Or Slow Tie three years ago, or like H last year. So we want to bring on talent who hasn't broken through yet and help them develop. I guess what we get out of it is like f first, it feels great, right, to take an artist from zero to hero. Like, if you can be involved in that journey, I think that's brilliant. I think also, selfishly as a company, that gives you brand exposure. If your following goes from 10K to a million, and we've been on that journey, then that's amazing for us. Um, and we also monetize your content in the sense that, you know, I mentioned you earn six or seven times more than you would on Spotify, 10 times more than you would on YouTube. And obviously, we take a cut of that to then kind of further support you and grow the business. Um, but the biggest thing for us is, is supporting people on that journey. Um, and then, yeah, I guess we would grow with you. That's really, really important. Thanks. Um, let's give it up for Alex, people. <laughs> All right, now, before we move on, I just want to mention that um, if you want to tweet about Instagram, about blog about um, this event, just hashtag MM Talks. We'd really love to hear um, how you feel about these events. And I just think that is big that Mixtape Madness, again, 
does these things for the public. Um, the tickets were three pounds, guys. <laughs> So please, hashtag MM Talks, um, share some knowledge with the people, if you, uh, if you will. Um, Austin, I'm so excited to speak to you. Um, I actively follow you on Twitter. And um, <laughs> you know how you take something and you foil it up and save it for later? That's what I do with a lot of your tweets. So, um <laughs> So... Um, just for everyone really in here, we need to all foil up the information and save it for later for practice. So, um, Austin, I just want you to introduce yourself um, a bit like Alex did. Yeah, definitely. Um, hi, guys. My name's Austin. Um, my most recent job was head of music, culture and editorial at Spotify for the UK and Ireland. Um, before then, I worked in radio. I had an eight-year career at the BBC where I was music manager for Radio One Extra. Um, so my entire career has been around curating content, connecting content with the crowds effectively, um, and listening to a lot of music. So that's what I've done. Um, I'm quite intrigued in your journey um, to some of the titles that you've had. Uh, I want to know, was it always a, a music thing for you? Were you always heavily interested in music? Did you always want to be in the industry? Um, did you ever think or plan to change things in the music industry, especially in the UK like you have? Um, that's a good question. You know what, I would say that like my journey is probably quite similar to a lot of artist managers where they just fall into it and then they make a career from it. Because I grew up in like a musical household in that we were all like big fans of music. I never thought I was gonna work in the music industry. And what happened was I was more interested in media as a whole, like TV, publishing, journalism, etc. And then what happened was I had a friend who was, who was rapping at the time, um, who lived on my estate. And just by like, pure coincidence, my mum had a job where um, she, got, she got to take a, like, a, a laptop home. And this was before everyone had like, a laptop or a computer in their house. That shows my age slightly. Um, so just by coincidence, because I was in that situation, it meant that I was like helping friends of mine like burn CD covers, make CD covers on Photoshop. Um, and without really realizing it, I was basically doing like a marketing manager, manager's job. So I had one friend in particular um, who was rapping and he went from rapping on the block to rapping on channel, AKA channel U, to MTV Bass and getting played on One Extra, do you know what I mean? So while that journey was going on, I was gaining a lot of informal music industry experience, do you know what I'm saying? I was, I was making contacts, I was making connections. And while that was going on, I was working for different media companies. And what I found when I was first trying to get into the industry was that when I was applying for the big jobs at ITV, BBC, Channel 4, etc., I was just getting bare rejection, like <laughs> just a bag of nose everywhere. Um, so I said to myself, all right, you know what, I'm going to try and turn slightly left. And rather than go for uh, the companies that are like frontline, I'm gonna look at the companies that service those bigger ones. So I remember used to watch TV programs and wait until the credits finished. And you know, like if you're the BBC or your ITV, for example, you will hire an external production company to make content for you. So I used to basically stop the credits, write down the name of the company, and then like research, do you know what I'm saying, like these companies. So I got a couple of breaks here and there. I'm shortening the story. I don't wanna talk for too much. I wanna, I wanna hear the people talk. Um, so, um, yeah, I had a couple of lucky breaks where um, um, I got jobs at different companies. And one of the companies in particular was a company called Zcard. And if anyone's, like, been to, like, a tourist attraction, they've been to Orton Towers, Chesington, they've been on a tube or whatever, you'll get, like, those fold-out tube maps or those fold-out maps where you can open them up. Mm -hmm. And the way that that pa paper's folded is called a Z, it's called a Zcard. So there's a patent on the way that you fold paper. So this little company based in Clapham called Zcard any single company in the world who wants to produce um, a Z card has to get a license from them. So even though no one's ever heard of this company before, they've worked with every single company you can think of. So I was making mad links, like as a 17, 18 year old, just as like an admin assistant, working for this tiny little company no one's ever heard of. So to anyone out here who's trying to get into the industry, like my number one piece of advice would be, yeah, you've got the big companies and you might be lucky in that they might give you an opportunity, but my opportunity came from the most unlikely of sources, do you know what I'm saying, Z Card Limited. Um, so yeah, so that was basically it. So I, I had a couple of different jobs. I was getting a lot of this informal experience with my friend who was making music. 
um, and then a job came up um, as a music programmer for uh, One Extra. By now, I was at the BBC working in the marketing department. Um, and I just thought, you know what, fuck it, man. Like, I'm a, I'm a big music fan. Yeah. I feel as though I know what the audience wants because I was 20 at the time, going on 21. So I was part of the target audience. And I applied for the job and a bit of a wing and a prayer, to be honest with you. Um, and they were crazy enough to give me the job. <laughs> and that was literally it. Um, so like I said, that's a shortened version of the story, but that's kind of how I got my first break into the industry. And then from that point on, like I said, it's always been about just trying to, uh, just like um, what Alex, your name, just like what Alex said, um, I've always tried to spot talent early, nurture talent early, um, put them on a conveyor belt, you know, towards success, um, and then reset and do it again. I love that. Um <laughs> I think it's so uh, crazy that you say that you used to stop the credits and write down the little companies that you uh, saw. And I just want everyone to take that away, fold that up. Because um, to get where you are, you always have to do that extra, that extra work. And, and not a lot of people do what you did. So um, the next question I want to ask is, what do you think now your role is in music and tech? Um, I would say my role is to connect, to be like a shepherd, mm. and just to connect great content with different audiences. Do you know what I'm saying? Because you've obviously got like a global audience or you've got certain audiences that are massive in size, right. but then you've then got niches as well. Um, and the internet has meant that niches are also massive. So historically, if you were part of a, a small subculture, there may only be a few dozen of you. But now you can have the most smallest subculture and there's millions of you all connected around the world via forums, social media, et cetera, shared experiences. So I feel as though it's my job and what I get most enjoyment uh, in doing is connecting great content with the right crowd. And sometimes that crowd's a global crowd. Sometimes it's a small niche audience, you know, like, like this. That's what I feel my role is. And technology plays, um, like Alex said, a really vital role in being able to do that efficiently. I come from radio, where it w you couldn't always get the music to the crowd in an efficient way because there's no way to target people in an effective way en masse. Do you know what I mean? It's just like a blunt instrument. You broadcast the song and it goes to however many people are listening. Do you know what I'm saying? But the difference between uh, traditional media and streaming services and similar platforms like Kiki, et cetera, um, I'm assuming if their data's good, that you, know, you, can, you can target people in a much more efficient way. Um, so yeah, that's what I'd say. Um, I think a, an in, I think an, an extension of your role is extending knowledge to people because on Twitter I do see you um, drop loads of gems just about marketing, just about music in general, and I just want to know why you think it's uh, important or essential to share that information with the public? You know what, I think it's important because um, when I was coming through, um, when I was like a teenager, early 20s, there, were, there wasn't anybody who looked like me or was from the same culture that I'm from, like council estate culture, um, that was in any of these type of positions, do you know what I'm saying? Like when I was sort of growing up, it was sports or music frontline music in front of the camera, do you know what I'm saying? Um, I didn't even know what a music programmer was or you know, someone like me could, could rise to that position, do you know what I'm saying? So um, I would say that the generation before me maybe failed in terms of bringing in the generation afterwards, do you know what I'm saying? And I think, um, so I'm in, I'm in my early 30s um, and um, I think my generation were like, you know what, this, we now need to bring in, do you know what I mean, the new generation, which is why people like Alex Boatang, Benny Scars, do you know what I mean, um, Alec, his brother, Twin B, who's at Atlantic, um, all they're trying to do all the time, myself included, is, is drop knowledge, do you know what I mean, to try and help and inspire the younger generation because um, the journey between myself and probably some people in this room is no different, do you know what I'm saying? Like, um, I grew up in an area where this was far, far removed, do you know what I'm saying, from reality. So now I'm in this privileged position and super lucky position. Let me just try and push the ladder down, do you know what I'm saying, and help, help the next set of young black boys and young council estate kids, no matter what their color, try and you know get up. I respect that a lot. Um, 
Austin, what do you think is an effective way to market yourself as an artist using technology, using social media? What is more effective <coughs> to you? Because you've, you've been on the other side of things. Um, you've been in that boss role and you have a look at artists that are trying to push through and you have obviously seen what works for some and, and what doesn't work. So if you just want to let everyone know what is the most effective method? I would say that, um, that there, there is no one formula that works. I think when I first got into the industry, when there was no such thing as streaming and there was only one route to market really and that was radio and then mainstream press and TV, there was a formula that the record labels and people that had investment were able to use time and time again. We're currently back in the Wild West era, and I love it to be honest with you, because it means that the rule book's just burning before our very eyes, and things that used, things that might work today might not work tomorrow. Things that don't work tomorrow might work next week. Do you know what I'm saying? Um, you might have someone like Dave, for example, um, release a seven-minute song, and if you look at the normal rules of what constitutes a hit record, a seven-minute song ain't that. Do you know what I'm saying? But he had a what you could potentially argue as a hit record that was a seven-minute song. Was it Hangman? Yeah, Hangman. No, it wasn't Hangman, it was another record. I've forgotten what it was called. Question, question time. time, that's it, question time. Thanks. Um, so, yeah, like, so, so for me, when I look at, like, when it comes to marketing strategies, now's the best time to be an artist or an artist manager or someone who's on the side of the fence of trying to um, grow in the industry because, because there are no rules. The failure rate isn't as noticeable. Do you know what I'm saying? Um, and I, I personally feel as though, like, really, the one thing that excites most people in the industry is when you market to your fans and then let that heat radiate against us. Do you know what I'm saying? Right. When I think about all of the artists that have grown to become something special, they've gone to their fans first, they've gone to the general public first, they've warmed that up, and then we in the industry have felt that warmth and that heat. Right. Do you know what I mean? And we're, we're gamblers effectively, right? So we place bets on people. Anytime the industry supports someone, we're just placing a bet on someone. And if we can feel something's radiating, something's warm, we're gonna place a bet on it. Um, so I would say that like, Go to your go to your audience, man. Like if you put as much effort into going to your local high street and trying to hustle some fans, whether it be you know handing out cards, do you know what I mean, putting on a lot, spending a couple hundred pound, putting on a, a little showcase and stuff, build up your evidence, do you know what I mean, so you can go to the industry, whether it be radio, streaming, you know, newspapers, whatever it is. If you can go to someone and say. Here's some evidence that shows that I've sold 75 tickets in my local town or my local area. Um, here's 50 tweets of support from my, my artists and stuff. That goes a long way because it's all relative is what I would say, man. You don't need millions and millions of streams or hundreds of thousands of hits or followers on Instagram. What people like myself tend to look for when we're looking to shepherd certain records to audiences is, you know, you know what, what are you doing? You know, where your fa where's your fan base? With all that being said, sometimes just one record that's just outstanding can just change everything for you. Do you know what I'm saying? So marketing goes out of the window, contacts goes out of the window, you just get one particular song or one viral moment. Do you know what I mean? And then that just that take that's your marketing strategy. Um, like Alex was saying, um, a lot of platforms on the internet right now are a little bit saturated. So how does an artist ensure that they stand out and that they can attract people like you uh, to their work? Um, again, I would say it's not about attracting me, it's about attracting the fans, do you know what I mean? And then us industry guys, like where cats will come <laughs> flocking, do you know what I'm saying? Um, but I would say um, in terms of the amount of music out there, you can't stop that. Um, there's an average of about 25,000 songs that get uploaded to uh, platforms every single week. Mm -hmm. So you're talking about like a tsunami of music, do you know what I mean? It's like, when I first started at Spotify in 2016, mm -hmm. it was an average of 9,000 records. So in three years, we've more than doubled, do you know what I mean? We're probably close to treble now, the amount of records that are coming out each week. So there's an endless buffet of music for the for for the general public to feed into. So again, there's no one magic bullet answer in terms of like how do you stand out. Mm. If you make good music, 
and you're organized and you've got a good marketing plan and you've got a good team around you, then you better your chances, but you're still up against tens of thousands of other people just in the same way that you might be able to do some amazing tricks with a football or you might be an amazing tennis player or whatever it might be, but there are also thousands trying to get to Wimbledon or trying to get to the Olympics or trying to win the World Cup. It's the same for in every single week when you're putting out your music, you're up against not just 25,000 people, mm. but the entire recorded history of music that's available to consume online. So you're up against 50 million songs as well. Right. Can, I, can I just... Yeah, no so problem. I was going to say, so I think you're exactly right. So be authentic, be unique, but also be smart. So you touched upon people coming to you with, like, I've sold 75 tickets. Like, if you come, and this goes back to the point I made about data, so you have access to that data. So if you can come to, to us or, or people like yourself and say, like, actually, I've got a big audience in Sweden. I ran this campaign in Sweden. I sold 150 tickets in Sweden based on the information I've taken. And I think that's also, like, put a little package together, you know, and then come and pitch. There's an artist called um, Jay Montel, um, who I did a little bit of work with, and we found that an influencer picked up their track in Sweden, and that was then their biggest market in Stockholm. And so they actually like, have an opportunity to go out there and tour and run some editorial things out there. And so I think if you know that, then, and you use that, and then you come with like, a bit of a package, I think that works. Yeah, definitely. And also, it's worth saying to you a lot that like, you've got two types of data, and this is the way that I see things. You've got empirical data, number data, then you've got cultural data. And they're both as important as each other. Now, the thing is with empirical data is that there's always going to be someone who's got better data than you. If you've got a million streams in a week, someone's going to get two million streams in a week. Like With numbers, they're important, and data is important in terms of the number side of things. But the anecdotal data, the, the cultural data, you can really stand out using that. Do you know what I'm saying? So that's what I'm talking about. I'm always super impressed when somebody can show um, me and my team's evidence of them selling tickets in their local area. Do you know what I mean? Or videos of kids on the bus singing lyrics to their artist songs or whatever it might be. That stuff goes way further in my eyes quite a lot of the time than I've got 100,000 hits on a particular um, you know, YouTube channel. Because it is is that the fact that they've really got a load of subscribers and that's why you've got 100,000 hits or a million hits? Or is it your actual song? But 50 kids on a bus singing the lyrics word for word, to me, that's super, super important. I want to ask... Um, was someone clicking? Yeah. <laughs> I want to ask... Um, why did you feel it was important to introduce playlists uh, and did you feel as though that was the method to kind of change um, how things are in, in the UK music industry? Did you feel like the playlists were your most effective method? Um, I know I talk a lot of shit on Twitter, but I didn't make playlists, unfortunately. I didn't invent really? the playlist. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't invent the playlist. The um, blogs are wrong. I, I mean, what I would say is that playlists are as old as recorded music. Mm. The album is a playlist. So I think there's been a lot of talk over the last few years about playlists. Yeah. Um, but if you look around us, do you know what I mean? If you, if, if you look at music has always been packaged up as a list of songs and then presented. It's just the medium that, that, you know, that, that it's presented on from obviously vinyl, cassette, CD, USBs, mini discs, do you know what I mean? And then obviously now um, sort of electronic files that, that are sort of streamed to your device. So um, yeah, I sort of, um, people are always gonna consume music. People are always gonna want music packaged up to them. It's interesting what Alex was saying about um, sort of crate diggers. Most people aren't crate diggers. Do you know what I mean? Most people have a lean back experience, the mass market, mm. they want a lean back experience. Um, so for those people, you have to serve them a particular way. And most people want a list of songs, whether it be genre specific or multi-genre, that means that they don't have to crate dig. Mm. And then you then have to find ways to target the, you know, if I was to put a number on it, maybe 25% of people that are out there that are music aficionados, music fiends that do sort of crate dig and want to be served up music in a very in a very different way, which is what you, which is why obviously if you look at radio as an example, historically you'd have daytime radio that was run on a playlist that was the more mainstream commercial songs, and then you obviously had specialist radio. So I think even when it comes to um, streaming platforms, you need to think in a similarish way. All right, how do we cater to the mainstream 
the lean back listeners mm -hmm. and then how do you cater to the lean in listeners? Would you say that it's imperative for artists to be able to market themselves before they come in contact with the likes of you, in contact with labels, in contact with A&Rs and managers? Is, is in this climate, is that what um, the people at the top are looking for, an artist that can maintain themselves before coming into partnership with them? I mean, before placing a bet, which is like I said, industry, everyone on this on this sofa right now, we, we place bets every day, right, on like what we think potentially might work yeah. with, with a particular audience. And like, I feel, it feels like a safer bet mm. when you have D Block Europe or AJ Tracy or Georgia Smith in front of you and there's organization, or Dave, there's organization, there's a team that you feel are gonna deliver for this particular artist, there's great music, and there's a track record that you can see on paper of them yeah. delivering. That feels like a safer bet than somebody playing a song that you feel isn't good, there's this organization, you don't trust the manager's gonna deliver, like, do you see what I'm saying? So, of course, man, like, if somebody comes to you and they've already got evidence of success, mm. that's always gonna be better than somebody who hasn't come to you yet with evidence of success. But with all that being said, like I said, the, the magic bullet on that is someone just plays a song and you hear it on the speakers or on the headphones, and it's like, this is just a banger. Like, yeah. you don't need to know anything about the artist, where they're from, how many hits they, doesn't, don't, data means nothing. Like, it's just a big record, like, so. Yeah. Thank you. I think the key word of today is data. Like, I didn't really know that terminology before today, so now I know. Austin, thank you so much for speaking to me. Um, let's cap it up for Austin, guys. Um, I imagine people want to ask questions. I'm going to come to you and then... Questions to Austin based on what you just mentioned. You've clearly had a great career, loads of contacts, loads of experience. You said the most exciting thing right now is management for an artist. And I was wondering, are you looking to go towards that? If so, I wouldn't say why, but kind of why. Yeah. And if not, why not? Because I noticed earlier on Twitter you said that you're taking six weeks off, I think, to find a new job. <laughs> yeah, I'm currently unemployed. <laughs> um, so I'll start a new job on Monday, which you guys will find out about soon. Um, so I did management for two and a half years. So what happened was when I was 25, um, I was at the BBC and I was in a really good position, but I felt kind of spoiled because my first full-time job in the music industry was the assistant head of music at One Extra. Do you know what I'm saying? Just because, like I said, I've told you the story before. So I wanted to challenge myself. So I left the BBC when I was 25 and I started up a company called The Hub Entertainment. And we looked after DJs, we looked after artists, and we uh, looked after a few other sort of different sort of talent. And um, management is great. I think the best form of management is when you're looking after just like one, one person and helping it to grow. But being a manager of a music artist, for you to make 10,000 pounds, for you to clear 10,000 pounds in your bank account, if you're doing it properly, your artist has got to gross over 100,000 pounds. Do you know what I mean? 130 or 40,000 pounds, depending on how you look at the maps and the tax around it. So you've got to generate a huge amount of success. And even in old money, when it was CDs and, and MP3s and stuff like, that's still a huge amount of money to gross for you to make 10,000 mm pounds, -hmm. let alone the average UK salary and, and more. Um, so that's one side of things. The finances didn't quite stack up for me in terms of from the music side of things when I'd done it. But then secondly, it's a very insecure job. Um, you can get fired at any second, even if it's contracted. The way that the law works in this country means that if you manage someone and they don't want you to manage them, it's very hard to legally say, no, I'm still gonna manage you, mm. do you know what I'm saying? And then obviously if someone doesn't want you to manage them, there's no point you being in a, in a business relationship with them anyway. So I looked at it and I was like, you know what, management in music, for me, doesn't, doesn't quite make sense. There are some amazing managers out there that have made it work brilliantly for them. Some of the names I've mentioned before, obviously. But for me, it did, yeah, just it didn't quite stack up for me. Thanks.
Um, hi guys, my name is David, so I didn't introduce myself earlier. Um, I run a production company. Um, so you, any, any of you guys can answer this question that I'm gonna ask, but how, um, so we all know like about how important tech is to music and um, before streaming came in, obviously all the legal websites and through the early 2000s, we all knew about that period and how music was kind of struggling financially because of tech. Um, how important do you think tech is to music do you think the current equation is right in terms of streaming per money and per outcome? And where do you think tech and music will go in the future? It's quite a varied question, I know. But Ruby, Austin, and Alex, uh, any of you can answer the question. You know, I'll just throw my two pence in. Um, I think if you look at the, the music industry as a business, it's due to streaming, and there's been enough articles that sort of break down the finances to show this, for the first time ever, it's also oh, first time for the first time in 15 years there's positive growth in the music industry it went from contracting and it's now expanding and there was a report that um i think it was jp morgan put out about a year and a half ago that said that the global music industry is going to be worth something like 50 billion dollars <coughs> by 2020 or sorry by 2022 um so there's absolutely no doubt that streaming has turned the fortunes around of the recorded music industry the work that people put into their music, they should always, nobody should make music, put their life and soul into music, put it out, and feel like they aren't getting paid a fair amount for it. Um, what's a fair amount to some per one person, especially someone who's maybe used to the CD way of sort of earning money? Um, I can see why people, some people are a little bit upset, confused, angry in terms of streaming payouts. I personally think, look at the positive side of things. Historically, you had the haves and the have-nots in the music industry. You were either having chart hits and making money, or you weren't. There was no in-between. What streaming has now created is a middle class, and there are now these people that I call secret millionaires. Do you know what I mean? There are people that you've never heard of because they've never been played on radio. They're not getting any major support. They're not in the newspapers, but they're making tens of thousands, and in some case, hundreds of thousands of pounds every quarter off their streaming royalties. Do you know what I'm saying? So I think something definitely needs to be fixed at the very top end in terms of the A-list artists. Like, how can they feel as though they're getting a fair deal? At the bottom end, when artists are only getting 10, 20, 30,000 streams, that needs to be fixed, but there's a huge expanding middle class of artists that are making more money than they ever did in any other era of music. Yeah, and <clears throat> just to add to that, I think um, the streaming platforms, although, like we mentioned, the compensation might not be fair on occasion, I think it is a platform for exposure. So, for example, you know, use that as a platform to grow your brand, grow your exposure, and then you can, you know, lean on brand partnerships for, for additional revenue. I think like technology will play a part in bringing things back to life from like a live perspective as well. So creating more immersive experiences. Like as an artist now, you can tour globally while sitting at home, in the sense that people are creating avatars. Um, and so there's like there's loads of interesting things like that within tech, which I think you can monetize as an artist. And you know, even if streaming isn't doing that. Hi guys, I'm Lewis. Um, I wanted to ask you touched on it briefly, Alex, in terms of being able to record your music and play it across the world. How do you think AI and virtual reality is gonna affect music in the coming years? So I think <clears throat> AI, AI has maybe negatively affected music discovery um, in the sense that, like, like I mentioned in terms of Spotify playlisting, like it can pigeonhole you. I think if you lose that editorial, that human touch, like you say, if someone creates a banger, like it's a banger, um, and sometimes an AI might not pick that up. So I think it can negatively impact music discovery. Um, but obviously there's benefits to it as well. You know, you can automate so much music discovery by having AI. Um, so yeah, I'm not sure. I think there's pros and cons to AI. And I think in terms of VR and tech, I think we haven't quite got there yet. I think it's still too expensive. But I think there's definitely certain events which are cropping up which are kind of embracing this technology quite nicely. And I, I can't wait really to see what happens over the next few years with, with VR and immersive events. Thank you. Yeah. Cheers. Um, firstly, thank you to uh, Quabs and all the team for putting this on. An incredible event, um, and I think we need more of this. So shout, uh, shout out to those guys. Um, my name is Leon. Um, this is for like Austin. Uh, since you've been around for so many evolutions of the, the, the music kind of uh, scene in terms of physical downloads and now streaming, um, where do you see things 10 years from now in terms of 
um, radio, playlisting, like uh, record labels, 10 years from now, what does the kind of music scene look like for you? Um, you know, if you had told me that we was going to be where we are now, even five years ago, even four years ago, I would have been like, nah, that's, this ain't where we're going to be at. So I think nobody can tell it, see into the future, especially, like I said, we're, during, we're in like a gold rush, Wild West kind of phase of the music industry where the rules are being rewritten every day of the week. Um, I think every current part of the in music industry needs to survive to have a healthy music industry in this country. And this is quite a unique market in the fact that, you know, if you look at the way that genres, you talk about pigeonholing, if you go into somewhere like America, for example, and listen to radio in America, you don't have stations like Radio One style, you know, stations in America where they play multi-genres, etc. We're quite unique in this country. So I feel as though streaming, record labels, um, publishing companies, independent labels, um, radio, press, TV, all of the functions at the moment that make the music industry and help um, all come together to make someone successful, an artist or a band, I think they're still going to be around. I just think their roles might change. So for example, you look at radio, radio was the home of discovery up until streaming platforms came around. I would argue that streaming platforms now, all of them to some varying degrees are now the home of discovery. That's where you first hear music on, 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 on mass. Um, I think if you look at major record labels, they used to be quite rigid in terms of the way that they would work with artists. But, you know, companies like Kiki and United Masters and Amuse and uh, Believe Digital and Ditto have come around and are forcing record labels to be more flexible in how they work with artists. Do you know what I mean? So I think maybe in 10 years' time, you're going to see even more flexible deals with the way that artists partner rather than sign to you know, major record labels. I think labels are still going to be around um, and they provide an amazing service when they work well for artists. Um, but yeah, it's, I, I think, you know, AI and, um, and VR is going to be interesting in terms of their applications. I've not heard an amazing AI song yet, um, but I don't know if you guys have heard about these deep fakes, the, the face fins. It's like, do you know what I mean? It's like if, if they're anything, if they it develop at the same pace of that, then who knows? Um, but yeah, man, I mean, that's a long-winded way of saying I don't know. <laughs> cool. Sorry, just to kind of follow up. Um, so I kind of always look at, um, I guess, different markets which are doing things really, really well. And I think South Korea, the way that they've kind of marketed their acts um, and how kind of, I guess, diverse those acts are in terms of being personalities, influencers, models, actresses and actors, and also a musician, uh, and how they managed to kind of come over here and, you know, and, and release records where no one knows what... Uh, Gangnam style is, for example. Um, my question is, is, do you kind of look towards, like, let's say, markets which are a bit different in terms of how we should uh, a approach marketing records, or is it always kind of US and UK very different to, let's say, Asia and uh, Africa? Yeah, I mean, I, I worked for Spotify, do you know what I mean, which you could argue was one of the main drivers of the globalization of you know records being able to much more efficiently cross um, uh, boundaries and, and, um, and borders. Um, it's an interesting one because I'm a big believer that if you look at like some of the global superstars, like Jennifer Lopez, for example, she'll have an English version of the album, then you know one in like a native tongue, etc. I think everybody should be marketing themselves completely different in territories. If I was a music artist, no matter what the genre, I'd have different color schemes, different artwork, different language versions, different intros, different song lengths. I'd be researching the markets, and then in the same way that um, Audi have different versions of their. A3 car for different markets with different trims and different colors and stuff. I'm doing the exact same thing, you know, with my music, man. I think that um, and the, the, the first person, whether it be like a rapper, singer, band, whatever, the first person who really nails that will be like a the next like global star. So yeah, definitely, man. You've got to market yourself different to each market. There are certain colors that on, on like, there are certain colors that work better in certain countries than others. Do you know what I mean? There are certain song titles that to you might you know, in one language might actually be a swear word, do you know what I mean? In another language, it's absolutely fine. So uh, yeah, man, definitely, I, I, I'm a big believer in that. But then some people don't want to mess with their art. Some people believe that this is my art, my song, my title, my artwork, and they don't want to mess with that. I'm, I'm more power to them if that's how they feel too. Cheers, thank you. Um, thank you, Alex and Austin, again. Um, we're going to take a short break, because before we speak to Ruby, I think we should give her a chance to stretch. So, um, and everybody else a chance to stretch. So we're going to come back at about quarter two, 
and speak to Ruby. So yeah, guys, mingle, have a stretch. All right, guys, if you want to find a seat, find a comfortable place. Um, we want to hear from Ruby right now. So if everyone just gets it together. Okay. Cool. Ruby, um, is your mic? Everything's I think so. Great. Um, how are you doing? Thanks for coming I'm through. Good. I'm glad that everyone decided to stay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So, um, you know, a lot of you might not know Ruby, so if you just can introduce yourself and just give brief details of your title, your line of work and stuff like that. Sure. Um, so I work at an independent label called Neighbourhood. Um, we work largely with a rapper called Dave. Um, I work across his label and his management. Um, and we also manage a producer called Sir Spyro and we develop new acts. Uh, yeah. Cool. So... Um I read that you were quite keen on uh, speaking on how streaming services and how uh, technology can empower creatives and empower artists. So do you want to just speak more on that? Yeah, so my background prior to working in management was working in streaming. So I worked at Apple Music. And, um, and then I went from that side of things to working on the artist side. Um, and it's a massive difference, but it's really, really interesting. And I think the kind of, when Krabs asked me to talk on this, I kind of made it clear, I was like, I'm not, I know the, you know, the basics about like um, AI and VR and all that sort of stuff, but really I think when you work on the management side, the, the part of technology that is most relevant is um, kind of like, yeah, the social media side and how you can engage with creatives. And I think, um, that's what I found the past year is the most um, kind of like empowering thing when you're working on the management side is like use social media for your benefit. It's so easy to scroll through social media and just get jealous of everyone else's successes or whatever. But if you actually curate your feed and make sure you're following like the best photographers in each city that you're going to or the best um, like art directors or the best... Um, producers or whatever you you automatically have a network around you that you can reach out to and especially um so like curate your feed put it into a, a google document and make sure that you always have these creatives at hand to dm when you need people because i think that is for me um have been the most empowering part of aside from obviously like when you work with if you if you work in british rap um, streaming has just been unbelievably amazing. I mean, streaming has been amazing for like all types of music, but especially watching like the charts develop in the last few years, it's been like incredible. But, yeah. Ruby, you have then seen both sides of the spectrum. You've worked with Apple Music, now you're working with an artist. So what would you say, or what would you advise uh, artists? Like what are some tools, marketing tools, uh, tech tools they can use to push themselves out there? I mean, I mean, there's so many. Like, it, it kind of depends what you want to do. I, I, there's obviously, like, all the, um, you know, as Alex was saying, like, m make sure you understand all your data. There's things like radio monitor, so you can monitor when your songs are being played. Um, there's, I think when it comes to marketing, the most important thing is just to be creative. Like, if you look at someone like Slow Tie, who probably doesn't, you know, they, they don't go out and do like massive, massive marketing campaigns, but the marketing campaigns they do are really clever and they spend a lot of time thinking of creative ways to do it. Um, and I think that's the most important thing. Make sure you have someone on your team that's like a real creative. Like I have a guy that I went, actually went to college with who is just like, to me, like a creative genius and I commission him for everything because I'm not that person. Mm. I think that's what it is, is like recognizing where your strengths are and bringing in people to do the parts that you might not necessarily be able to do. Yeah. Um, quick question to the crowd. 
Did anyone stream the UK rap playlist on Apple Music? Yeah, I did too. So I was just telling Ruby um, earlier, um, you played a part in that, didn't you? No? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you, she did. Um, not to put you under any spotlight, but um, what was that process about? How, why was it important to do that? And how do you think it changed things? Um, I mean, when I basically, when I was working at Apple, I, was, I worked there shortly after the launch. And at the time, they didn't have a UK rap playlist. And I'd grown up going to school near here in Hackney, where that was like what people listened to. And I just kind of said to them, oh, it'd be cool to like have a playlist where that was represented. And it was just after Giggs's Landlord album had come out. And it was like, the UK rap was obviously like getting to a point now where it needed that space. Um, so I launched that in two, three years, 2016, three years ago. No, 2017. That's when 2016. I was listening. <laughs> <laughs> I can't remember. I think it was 2016. And, um, and did that for a bit. Um, and yeah, that was amazing because it was like just being able to watch artists um, that otherwise might not have had a playlist to sit in, like, like largely like smaller artists. Um, develop, yeah, that was good. <laughs> Would you say that it's, it should be a goal for artists to uh, end up on a playlist? I think it's tough because it's, it's not the be all and end all, and I think it's really easy to think that. I think when you're working with an artist, it's like you have your goals and you're like, right, I want to be in this playlist and I want to be in that playlist, and then if you don't get in them first week, you're like, oh, that's it. Yeah. Um, but I think there's loads of artists who might not necessarily stream amazingly, but are so important culturally. And I think when it comes down to that, it is important to remember like the the other sides of music. Like if you look at someone like Tierra Whack when she made that like amazing like 15 minute music video, um, and really cemented herself as someone really important. And obviously wasn't doing like the most amazing streams because her songs are all one minute long but she developed a whole other side to her. Um, so I don't think it's the be all or end all, but obviously, it, it, I mean, you can't even lie. Like when you're working with like a new act and you get added to a playlist, you do see like a lot of time, like a really, really good uplift. So obviously it's a great place to be in. Um, but you might, it might not happen on, on day one. Like I've seen it from both sides. Like you often have to convince people. And I think like, I mean, you, you always do. I think like if you're like, like I remember being on the other side and people being on, you know, like meeting industry people that weren't convinced by Dave, and now it's like right. everyone's convinced by Dave, so that's great. But Definitely. you, you know, you'll have to talk people around a lot of time. So playlists for me um, gives me that discovery space, like Alex was saying. So, is that the impact that you wanted that to have? Um, yeah. Definitely. I mean, that's what I think most... It's hard because obviously every single playlist means a different thing. Like, as Austin was saying before, you have people that are like real lean back listeners and they literally just want to be served like a roundup of everything that's out that week. And you have people that really want to discover things. Um, and I think a good playlist would show like, you know, whether you're like a uh, like trap rapper from Cardiff or you're like a drill artist from Scotland or whatever, it would like showcase you if your music's good, like regardless of where you're from. Um, and yeah, I think there's like, there's nothing better than listening to a place and discovering something that you really, really like. But people listen to playlists for different things. Right, and um, we've spoken so much about artists um, and you mentioned that you are working with a producer. So uh, is that different because are they met marketed differently to artists what is that process like yeah i mean it's, it's very different like, i think when you're working with a producer um it's more about like when you're working with an artist you're like marketing a brand when you're working with a producer i mean it depends some producers want to be marketed in that way but a lot of producers want to be able to work with the best possible artists and get the best possible cuts and um Everyone, all producers are different. Some of them will want to put out an artist project and some, a lot of them DJ and tour. And um, so you, you, you work across um, a lot of the live part as well. Um, but generally, I find, I think producers are a bit more laid back because mm. that, that they're less in the public eye. And um, they just, a lot of them are essentially, like, you know, you're essentially like a 
professional music nerd and you just want to make sure you're in the studio of the best possible artists. But yeah, it's definitely, it's different because you're not thinking about like, um, unless they've got like an, a producer album out, you're not thinking in terms of like, right, we're marketing an album, then we're touring, then we're doing this. Are you then marketing perhaps a sound rather than... Yeah, I, mean, I think now with the sort of rise of like beat tags, everyone, it, it's a lot more in the, in the public eye, right? Like everyone knows who like Metro Boomin is or like everyone knows who like Still Bangles is. And even Spyro, who, who, who we look after, he's got, he's got like the sound of the Serb beat tag. So they probably, I think, producers are a lot more in the public eye and you have that side to them. But also I think um, as a producer... Um, a lot of it is about kind of integrity and making sure that you're working with the right people. Right, so um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to throw it out to the audience if anyone has any questions for Ruby and then we're going to come back and listen to two members of the team. So you put your hand up. Thank you. It's a bit of a cheeky question, so brace yourself. You guys manage Dave. Okay, cool. We've seen Dave jump on a ghostly beat and preview a drill track. We've heard him shout out MK the plug. We've seen rappers do drill. Will Dave be doing drill? I don't know. Only he could answer that. It's so funny because that is literally like, when's the drill track coming? I don't know. He, I, don't, I think the last thing he tweeted, he said he wasn't, it wasn't going to come out. But maybe it will. Honestly, I literally know as much as you guys because he will like... That's what's quite nice about working mm. in a small team is like he could wake up tomorrow and be like, right, I want to put this out. And then we're like, okay, all stations go because yeah, we can, yeah. there's less of us so we can move quite quickly. I know nothing. <laughs> cool, thank you. <coughs> yeah, hi there, Ruby. Um, yeah, I've ha we've had many email <laughs> wars because there's many bangers I've sent you that haven't made a playlist. <laughs> so I know you're very honest with your playlist selection back then. Um, I guess what was the toughest part of making that transition from being on the other side of the fence and entering management. And then out of curiosity, what was your favorite digital activation in relation to the whole Dave campaign? Because that Ooh. campaign was phenomenal. So well done to That's you That's a team. good question. Um, you know, I'll answer the second question first. I think actually, ironically, my favorite part of the activation was like the non-digital part, <laughs> which was um, when we did, we did some pop-ups. We did a pop-up in Manchester and Bristol and London and it was just crazy because it was literally like it felt like the 90s or something we were like bundled into a van went up did these pop-ups like came home at like three in the morning woke up next day did them all over again and it was like that was when you actually got to like connect with the fans because I think on the digital side it's it's great but like you don't meet that many fans like I mean, when I worked on the streaming side, I never met any fans. So meeting people when they were coming up to me saying, like, what's your favourite What's your favorite um, track from the album? I bet I know, I bet it's Leslie. <laughs> I'd be like, no. <laughs> so it's like, it was just interesting seeing that side. And I think on the other side, yeah, it was, I mean, it was, it's completely different, definitely. Like working in a, in a, in a corporate... Like I really like the fast pace of working for a big company. Um, I think that's... I went to, like, a really strict college in Hackney called Mossbourne and I feel like it drilled it into me that like I have to be stressed all the time <laughs> so I liked that side of it but I think um what the the human element of working with an artist is like unbeatable like watching an artist go from playing Camden Assembly to like a few years later like yeah a few years later playing Brixton Academy was like insane like I was like in, almost in tears which I don't you don't get so much when you're working more with like data <laughs> So whoever's next, um, I was gonna ask you, Ruby, what is the hardest thing or the most challenging thing you've had to do, or the least enjoyable? You can answer anyone. Oh, that's really hard. On the management side. Um, I don't know. Challenging. I mean, it's all challenging, really. I mean, putting doing like putting out an album is is hard because. Mm you're working on like a crazy deadline for like physical production. So that's like the big difference, I guess, between working. When you're working with singles, really the single can kind of go back because you're not printing vinyl or yeah, producing vinyl and producing CDs. But when you're doing an album like that, you're on like the maddest deadlines and we are not 
great at deadlines. So that was like very, very challenging. Mm. Um, and also just making sure that like when you've got an album that's like that deeply personal, um, that you're executing it properly. Because, you know, if somebody puts that much work into an album uh, and your duty is like the management or the label is to make sure that it reaches as many people as possible in the best possible way, it's you. It, you got to do it because, and and I know everyone's probably heard the album. The album is like amazing, so we had the the pressure of making sure that that was executed properly. Thank you. Um, yeah. Um, in general, uh, music does interlink. So different sides of music interlink. But obviously, change is very challenging as well, and some people do find it daunting. So for you, from working at Apple and moving towards neighborhood as a label. How did, how was the transition for you, basically? So like adaptation to different things, basically. It was, yeah, it was good. It was, I mean, it was funny like how I came into that job. Like when I, basically when I was working at Apple, I met my boss, Benny Scars, who Austin talked about. Um, I met him at Apple, but then we kept running into each other at really random places. We went to a weird office party and it was just me, Benny and Lindsay Lohan. And I was like, this is <laughs> really weird. And eventually like we, we were like, right, let's sit down and meet properly and that and they were like, we want you to come work for us. And they and Jack and Benny are like the most amazing managers ever. Like most people in the industry will tell you that they are just so amazing. Um, and so I kind of wasn't that nervous because I was like, I know that these guys are like serious, serious managers. And I'd learned so much at Apple like unbelievable amounts, but nothing to prepare me for working with an artist. So yeah, I think I was like, I didn't really, it was, yeah, it was a bit, I had like, I was lucky. I had like a few mentors that I spoke to before and they were like, go and do it, go and work Jack and Benny. And I was like, I knew, so it, it was good. But um, yeah, I think on paper, it probably sounds scarier than it is going to work from, and at the time, it was just us three. We've now got a bigger team. We've got a guy called Jesse, who's amazing, who's like Dave's friend, and we've got a guy called James, who came over from um, Ditto, who's also amazing. So we've got like a slightly bigger team now. Um, but I think when you meet people and you and you know that they're, you get their character and you know that they're really good at their job, you know you're going to learn a lot from them. So maybe that made it less scary. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Let's show Ruby some love, guys. Um, I'm soaking up so much information today, and I hope that you guys are too, and I really hope that you do hashtag MM Talks if you want to tweet or if you want to share anything on the gram. Please do hashtag. We do want to know how you guys feel about the events because we're going to give you more and more um, content like this. Okay, so next up, we're going to hear from Leon. So um, I'm just going to let you do your thing. Thank you. Um, so I'm the B-Tech replacement for Austin, um, since he's now ducked out, I think. Um, yeah, so I work for a major label currently. Uh, I won't disclose who that is, but I head up innovation for that major label. Um, been doing that for about five years, but my background is architecture, um, and I first came into labels uh, overseeing big data and, and, and analytics. So kind of when I first came into the major label, um, like margins were slim. Apple came in and decimated all the kind of the industry and uh, major labels could no longer charge 18 pounds for, a, you know, for, a, for a, you know, an album. Um, and our budgets, our budgets were really slim. So it was my kind of job to go in and make things efficient and using data. So when I came in, You'd have wild A and R guys chartering damn jets to go and see a band in Germany off of a hunch, and I'd come in and say, "If you give me that kind of hundred thousand pounds, or whatever it might be, I can build you a platform using kind of like you know um, different business rules that can give you a target hit list of who to go and um, go and uh, take a li listen to." So I kind of came in at the right time to kind of you know bring in that kind of data uh, insight, and I cut my teeth in advertising and technology as well. But I'd always had a passion for music, so um, you know, just growing up in London, I was always a fan of like Risky Rose and Lord of the Mics and that kind of stuff. So, at the major label that I'm at now, under the kind of innovation department, um, I started this brand called Run the Mic, which is um, first and foremost an application that allows people to kind of jump on and spit bars over 
you know, uh, either well-known beats or, um, you know, like new beats. Um, you know, I, was, I, I kind of looked at the way that urban music exploded in terms of consumption, uh, and I would look at tools like, or let's say platforms like Musical.ly, Dub Smash, TikTok, and that was aimed at the kind of pop demographic, but I was like, hey, if urban music is absolutely killing it, how can we not have the same kind of tools for our demographic? So I went and kind of built this uh, POC uh, proof of concept, um, and lucky my kind of CEO really loved it. He put me in the same room as like Charlie Sloth and Ryan Leslie, and um, at the time, you know, they kind of all loved it. Uh, so I went away, and it was my skill set is to go and find development teams who can build pr like big platforms at scale. So I found this development workshop up in Newcastle, tasked those guys and to build it. So. Um, we built that, and now it's kind of built into like a larger brand where we do like live events. So we do a quarterly kind of takeover of Harvey Nichols, and we you know we 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 wreck the store every once in a while. Um, and then we have a long form content series in partnership with Mixtape Madness called Bag It Up, um, and that's hosted by Harry Pinheiro. And again, like I always look at thing, other things for inspiration. So I looked at Complex and what they're doing, like sneaker shopping, and I'm like. How can we have so many artists and you know actors and athletes here with so much swag, but we have nothing like that over here? So um, I kind of brought that concept to you know Harry Pinheiro and brokered a deal with uh, Harvey Nichols at the time, and you know Quabs is a visionary. He listened to my crazy ideas and was like, okay, cool, we'll take a you know we'll take a punt on that. Um, so we're kind of you know we we're releasing the second episode tomorrow with Heady One, and we've shot M. Huncher, and we've got, you know, Young Bane, JK, Wilfred Zaha wants to jump on it too. So I look at things which really work well in the culture, regardless of where it comes from, and I try to kind of replicate it here. So, um, yeah, I kind of oversee, you know, the creation of our merch, the live events, building the application and development team using data. Um, so I kind of wear a few different hats. But uh, it's all kind of born off of utilizing data and always just kind of thinking innovatively about where we kind of go from here and, you know, kind of the state of play. So how do artists create content, distribute it and monetize it, you know, really kind of, you know, effect effectively. That's kind of always at the forefront of my mind when it comes to anything that I do. Um, and luckily the major label has given me the kind of freedom to, to go and build out that kind of division and build platforms like this that could hopefully kind of, you know, create opportunities for people or great content or, you know, just kind of just be fun for people to work with. So, um, yeah, that's kind of my remit. Cool. I just want to ask, because I want to know, um, what, is, what is your take on platforms such as Mixtape Madness? How Im important is their role in pushing out um, ideas like yours, like Bag It Up and stuff like that? Why is it important that you partnership with people, platforms like us? Uh, firstly, I'm not even just saying this because I'm on the panel, but Mixtape Madness are the number one platform, regardless of how the other platforms, how many subscribers they have. Like, for me, I always go to Mixtape Madness to kind of see who's hot, like, and who's relevant now. But then also, I guess it's just kind of a, a mindset, you know, I've, I've always been an ideas person, and I've took my ideas to other platforms, um, you know, before me and kind of Quabs knew each other, and I kind of pitched it to them, but at the time, they were more interested in, like, in the bag, so I think, you know, it's kind of got to a point where certain people, they want, uh, this, this is, I have to remember my, my, my position sometimes, but um, I like to work with people who are, have genuine kind of interest in the scene and, and, and really building things. And, uh, you know, you can kind of see with Mixtape Madness' um, progression over the last, I would say, year, that people know that I guess are the most credible within the scene. And for me, it's about partnering with those individuals because I've had meetings with every platform, um, you know, all the big kind of tech companies, and usually when, when I walk in, they're kind of, you know, the, all they're interested in, like, is what's your name, how much clout have you got, what's your role, for example, before you talk about the ideas. But I source my ideas from everyone, you know, as long as you've kind of, you know, you've got a genuine interest in, in mind. Um, so, you know, I think just from that perspective, I think um, Mix Save Man is a very open-minded and have a genuine passion for the scene, and those are the guys that I really fuck with. Um, yeah. <laughs> Big up Mixtape Madness for one. Hundred percent. Kingsley, Gus, Fadumo, Quabs. It's like, it's, like, it's like the fucking Avengers of the urban scene. Aww. Big up the team for real. 
Um, does anyone have any questions for Leon at all? Go on. Just asked all the questions today. I'm pretty familiar with Run the Mic. Uh, I've done some work with Shakira recently. Thank you. Yeah. So um, I was just going to ask, I've asked her, but I want to ask you, um, what's it like, like, actually bringing that from its base, basically, to actually, like, reality, like, starting something from zero to having its own actual platform? Um, I would ask Mixtape Madness, but I don't know where Quabs is. But I'll, I'll ask you in a bit. But, yeah, so, like, what's it like, actually, like, bringing something from zero so all the way up, and you said you went up to Newcastle, and you and you like, what's the story behind it? And like, how hard and like, or easy, or what? What's the best takeaways from the actual process of doing that? So, when I kind of first started my professional career, uh, I worked in a lot of startups early on, and you know, I was kind of lucky to be a part of certain teams that have that. You know, there was like two, three man teams that built something, you know, and then ultimately ended up selling it for millions. So I already kind of saw that journey from, you know, a couple of people who people looked at as crazy with an idea that they knew would resonate with an audience and following that journey from kind of inception all the way to delivery. Um, so I always had that kind of belief in that, you know, if you have the skill set and the passion and the obsession to follow through with an idea, that kind of anything's you know anything's possible. I think the one thing that you have to really um, perfect is the way that you uh, sell the value of what you do, because a lot of people they have great ideas and you know we you know but in terms of making people see that vision and the end goal to kind of let's say whether it's to get investment you know Key's done a great job of you know of, of securing an incredible investment they got a great story to tell as well. Um, it's just about inspiring people, whether it is your audiences and your consumers, about what they kind of get out of it. And then also kind of, you know, the C-level executives that might be quite far removed from, from the culture. But, you know, being able to kind of balance that, um, I guess, storytelling and, you know, being adept at selling to kind of C-level executives about what you do, whether it's, you know, they kind of usually like to see things in numbers, decks, very kind of cold, hard-hitting facts. Um, and coming from a startup background and seeing how people kind of win investment from venture capitalist companies or uh, angel investors or private equity firms, I knew what would float the boat of a CEO, for example. But then on the flip side, you know, going to, let's say, people who are within music, whether it's um, convincing Harry Pinheiro that had never worked with us before, had never, you know, we never had any kind of long-form content out before, but to believe in, you know, my vision of, like, let's go and do what Complex are doing, and you should be the face of this. Like, Joe LaPuma, who does sneaker shopping, you know, is has got as much personality as a plank of wood, but Harry Pinheiro is electric on camera. So he has that, you know, and I've, that kind of, uh, he sees that vision. So being able to kind of sell it to different people, that's kind of, for me, a big part of it, is knowing what resonates with an individual and selling it into them at that kind of point and uh, following through. Just, you know, a lot of people will tell you that you're crazy, that it's impossible for you to do that. Like, even within my company, I've had so many people that have said, that's impossible, you'll never get a brand deal, you'll never do this, you'll never do that. You know, you're, you're two X, Y, and Z. But you have to just kind of believe yourself that you, know, you are the, person, the sane person in a room full of crazies, not that you're the crazy one in a room full of sane people. And then just kind of be obsessive with it, work day and night. You. That's a great answer, and I really appreciate that um, you think it's important to keep the UK scene current with other things that's going on in hip hop culture and rap culture elsewhere in the world. So, things like Bag It Up, I literally just saw a trailer, I think, and I thought it was cool. And Leon, we appreciate you for that. So, Thank you. Um, yeah, um, let's give it up for Leon. Thank you. And so, um, Lastly, I'm going to give the mic to Kingsley, um, and he's going to tell you a bit about himself. Hello. All right. Hello. Um, yeah, firstly, I guess I'd just like to thank everyone for coming. It's like a real kind of pleasure and honor just to see uh, people come out. Um, my name is Kingsley. I'm one of the co-founders at Mixtape Madness and um, the technical officer, as it were. So I guess my journey was... Uh, Back in 2009, I, I believe it was, um, 
uh, my my fellow co-founders came together and you know he had an idea to start this music streaming or a platform where people could um, download free mixtapes from and um, uh, I come from a technical background where I'm an actual developer I write code and um, he came to me and said like he's got this idea but he doesn't really know what to do with it um, well he doesn't know what to do with it but he just needs I guess an enabler or someone to kind of help with that kind of journey and um, so you know we we went away and we we, we, we brought up the rest of the other co-founders together that were doing things like marketing and um, yeah, finance and, and, and business development etc and uh, uh, you know I was instructed with the job to build and create this platform which would uh, revolutionize or um, the way or that 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 would that would I guess change the face of urban music almost and um, um, mix it man. It started off as a streaming platform where we used to um, uh, people used to download mixtapes and back in those days before Spotify came and Apple Music came, people actually used to download music onto iTunes and then um, yeah sorry download it onto computers and it would go into their iTunes and that's old school. I don't know how many of the of you guys are from that era so some of you guys are a bit spoiled now but yeah we used to do that back in in, in those kind of early days um, and you know Mix It Madness was um, doing the most for at the time and there was no one like it and you know I built the infrastructure I built the brand for it and um, you know I really we, we started that journey into what we see now nowadays of course Mix It Madness has um, evolved a lot heavily into a music platform but the foundations were almost was is always and has always been about, um, I guess, birthing or, or uh, discovering new talent for, um, I guess, of the generation that we are. And that's kind of the ethos, the ethos that we, we tend to go on. So whatever new um, kind of ventures we go into, so now we're doing heavily on YouTube, um, but you know, we do, uh, uh, we do a lot with music distribution. So we work with the likes of Ruby, the likes of Austin to get um, artists playlisted or get artists um, radio plugged or just nips you just distribute the music onto these platforms where um, a lot of, well, some, some, some art, up and coming artists didn't really know how to. And um, so yeah, so my journey has always been um, creating the products behind Mixtape Madness, um, which I guess builds the, the brand and the presence of the brand and also working with the, the, the distributors, working with, with, with the fellow team members who, um, who are um, building some of the product, who are uh, the face of some of the products, but I'm actually just um, there kind of building um, some of the core infrastructures behind uh, Mixtape Madness. Kingsley, how does Mixtape Madness ensure that it keeps evolving? You said before that you just started off as a platform where people could download mixtapes. Now, Mixtape Madness is just so much more than that. I mean, MM Talks have branched out of that. So how do you keep evolving Mixtape Madness? So, um, I mean, for me, uh, you know, I am being a developer, I'm always about like building products. I'm always about like looking at what's next, looking at what technology is next or looking at, um, you know, how, how, how things are growing. And I think um, as well, we have an incredible team of people who are in the culture and, you know, we pride ourselves in um, staying true to the culture and the culture is all about for what it means to me is about following I guess the sound of the generation and today it might be drill or trap rap tomorrow it might be I don't know some next form of alternative R&B and for Mix It Madness we're always about just staying true to the current culture as it uh, as it is now and we are always just constantly looking for opportunities to innovate and um, to grow the, the, the business. So um, yes, uh, originally it was all about um, streaming um, music on the website. And then we went into um, the, the mobile app as well where we were streaming music before Spotify came. And then, you know, the demand of Spotify and I guess the, the money that they had and maybe the, the resources they had made it easier for them to continue that kind of journey. And then we decided, you know what, 
let's innovate further and let's um, tap further into our market through um, the YouTube channel. And then also we thought, OK, let's um, tap further into our market and help our artists get their music out there. And then, you know, we went into, you know, looking, actually managing artists as well. So um, the key for us is just always staying authentic to our culture and finding the gaps or the opportunities to, uh, th th for us to fill. And um, even with MM Talks, we obviously have planned to tra transition into the podcast um, area so that we can just make these discussions um, much more accessible for everyone. And um, you're nodding. Do you feel that idea? You think it's a great idea? Thank you. <laughs> Um, so I'm very excited about that, and I just want to big up Mixtape Madness again because it's things that they don't have to do. They don't have to share the knowledge. I mean, where else do you get the knowledge from? So, um, Kingsley, thank you so much for sharing that with us. Um, did every, anyone have any questions for Kingsley or about Mixtape Madness? Leon. Yeah, I mean, I would like to kind of understand uh, how you guys measure your own ex own success. I think I talked about other platforms focusing more on, let's say, revenue. But with you guys, it seems a bit more kind of, like you said, mentioned about kind of being authentic to the scene. Do you guys have hardened, like, KPIs? Or um, is it just kind of like feeling your way through and what feels right to you guys? And how do you come up with those KPIs? Um, I guess um, uh, we... We, I guess we, we just focus, we, we look at kind of the trends that are, that, that are currently going on in, within, within our scene. And um, like I said, we, we try not to, as much as we use data and insights and, you know, we're looking at stats between um, the growth of like our YouTube channel, the growth of our, um, uh, our social channel. So obviously we have, we have like bi-monthly or, or monthly reviews where we kind of look at the stats of these kind of co our core channels, such as our social profiles and um, our YouTube numbers, uh, our website hits, and you know we measure, we we, we 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 aggressively measure and look at those on a monthly basis and see. Um, we look at trends of things that we're doing well in in each kind of monthly or quarterly period, and we just um, you know take hold of those things we're doing well and we put our efforts into them and you know and then the more traditional side of things is where um our team are amazing a and r's so you know the guys actually are on the ground listening to what the sound is in the culture or in the scene at, at the moment so we're not we're not um we're not overly glamorized just because artist a has got billions of views but if um, an artist who we think is generally cold, we're just going to go with the guy that we think is cold, not just the guy that has got billions of views. I mean, you know, out of like a hundred submissions, emails that we get every day for uploads, we only upload, we only accept 10 of them. And, you know, people come to me all the time and are like, oh, can I get my tune on Mix It Madness? And I'm like, it's not that easy. It's like, I don't even choose. And you know, I wouldn't reveal the person who chooses because then people would just be on their on onto them all the time. So, um, you know, our keys are just um, looking at our, 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 our stats and latching onto those kind of key indicators of where we're seeing growth, and also just staying authentic and listening, actually listening, physically listening out to um, kind of the sounds and and what 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 the culture is saying. Um. You just touched on it, but a lot of people um, reach out to me and, and a few other people, and they ask how can they get their you know, music and stuff onto Mixtape Madness. Is there like a general, um, I guess, email or a general person? What should they do for people who want to be part of the team or who so, want their music up? On so Mixtape Madness, we're always listening. Um, you know, you may not think just because you're, yeah, you know, you're not on the most popular platform. We're always listening. Like we might catch you at an event. We might 
to see you on the road or whatever. We're always listening to what's going on. So, you know, no doubt if you're talented, you know, we will pick you up. But generally, we have a submissions email um, that you can ask me afterwards. Um, the criteria, like I said, is it's not the same for every person. It's just generally if you're if we believe you're good, um, you know, you you'll get on. And you know, I can't give you that that magic formula. It's it's, it's to the ears of the A and Rs that that listen out for the music. Is there space for uh, artists that aren't traditionally rap? Yeah, I mean. <laughs> So obviously, um, a lot of the music that surfaces on 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 our channel and our platform um, is uh, tends to be kind of um, trap, drill, and hip hop. But it doesn't mean that you know we we don't listen out for the alternative guys. Um, there are some some alternative tunes that are on the platform, um, and there is definitely a space. And I, I'm sure you know we've been looking at different ways to introduce that more and more into into the platform but with these things it takes time and you know it takes just making sure that our audience is going to take to it in the right way so it's it's we don't reject it's just you know timing and you know us phasing in in the right way and like as the brand grows as you know we build more um products and you know we collaborate more with people such as Kiki and um, Run the Mic, it, it gives us avenues to to tap into those different markets and those different sounds. And um, yeah, so it, we, we, we don't say no to, 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 to no music as it were. If you're good, if you're good enough, then you know, you, you'll find your way on the platform. Thank you. And so if nobody has any questions for King, you do? Great. Uh, my question was, you guys, even though you're popping and you are essentially the premier platform when it comes to the space currently, you've had a really long journey. A lot of us in the room today who are attending, I believe, are in the infancy of what our, what our journey is. What's been your biggest challenge and how do you get through it? Because at times it seems a very frustrating space. Yeah, I mean, we've we've gone through like lots of rocky roads and, you know, that's just business in general. Like we've been going for 10 years uh, coming up to 11 years now and you know it's only the last few years I guess that our dominance the, the when, when I look at the stats anyway like the way our the growth figures have gone in the last like two three years it's been a lot more phenomenal than the other years but the years before I guess the um, the measures were different like our popularity was uh, it wasn't as high numbers wise but it one thing that kind of I think stay stayed the same throughout, and I, I I'll leave it to everyone else to vouch is that we we've always stayed true to you know what we believe in, and maybe at a time what we we believed in everyone else didn't believe in, so we didn't uh, rock it as high. But you know that authenticity kind of has paid off, and now. You know, people generally rock with us because they believe that we stay true. Um, yeah, it's, it's been a rocky road, but I guess all I can say is it was just time and patience and I think just innovating, just um, like, I think when we started creating content like Mad About Bars and Next Up, um, you know, that was a game changer. And, you know, there was a lot of artists that we birthed from there. Um, Aroka Dabra and Honcho, we've had Hedy, we've had Harry... Um, uh, Harley Capra, we had so many artists that was just birthed out of, out of, out of that and um, I think that just gave us more and more of a platform and it, then you know we, we thought why don't we use this as an opportunity to distribute this on the streaming platforms because no one else was doing it and again another market that we tapped into so um, I think with a good team with just like solid foundation and just long, long, long standing just natural hunger to continue to continue and stay authentic it's 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 worked out for us thank you um, yeah. i'm really hogging this sorry um one thing i've got to say as well is that maybe a lot of people don't see and i really respect this is i think it was probably through the longevity of mixed madness but you guys genuinely do a lot of things for the scene and for people that you don't really see um you know like working at a major label myself, there were times where I'd have a meeting booked in with Quabs, mm -hmm. and he'd cancel on me, and I'd be like, how the fuck is this guy canceling on me? But he's like, listen, I'm sorry, I have to go and help someone, or let's say represent someone in court, 
like that people won't actually necessarily see. And I think those are the things that I truly, really respect because some people, you know, specifically in let's say major labels, if things are going tough for a certain artist, they might not necessarily be there. But I think, you know, with Mixtape Madness, I genuinely, I've seen that so many times with them where people don't probably see that it's not glamorized, it's not part of it, like, I guess, the story. But, you know, where they're from and, I guess, what you do for the culture, for me, is like, that was a real, a real shock to me, the, 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 the difference between, I guess, major labels and the culture there and what you guys do is, you know, even if it means sacrificing a bit of, like, a business deal or that kind of stuff, you guys will do that and you have that integrity. And I completely respect that. I'll, I'll, I'll always say that's, that's dope. I feel the same way, man. Mixtape madness is so essential to the culture. I'll just pass it to you. Uh, quick question, Kingsley. Um, so, since you're like you're, you guys are running your own company, how do you manage um, your personal time between your work time? Because I'm having, the, I'm like, I'm going through the same thing running a production company as well. It's like, do you say you're going to get whatever work done and work 24s and just get it done? Or do you like, all right, cool, this week I'm doing nine to five and after five is like my personal time. Like, how do you? No day is the same, to be honest. I mean, like, we, we, have, uh, we have an amazing team around us. I'll be honest with you. Like, some of the guys, like, work endless and endlessly and just effortlessly to kind of, uh, to support, to support the business. And I think for me, um, my focus is always about empowering the team around me because at the end of the day, um, a lot of the guys are the guys that are on the ground shooting the videos or, um, uh, you know, like finding artists. And for, for me, Crabs, Eddie, and uh, we're, we're all about just like business development. We're all about like focusing on, like I said, ways to empower and to build and to grow the business. Um, no day is the same for me. Um, I couldn't tell you today, you know, what I'm going to do tomorrow, what I'm going to do. Um, you know, yeah, fair enough. Some days it's just my day where, you know, I'm, I've got to do stuff with my family and whatnot. But there's no, there's no, um, like, Monday to Sunday, I'll be working, doing MM. Um, there's no magic formula. I, I, there's no magic formula. Fair, fair enough. <laughs> So, I think we're going to wrap it up here. Um, everybody's happy with the information that they've taken. Nobody has any last pressing questions. Um, if not, I'll just take this time to thank the Mixtape Madness team. Um, can we have a round of applause for the Mixtape Madness team? There's a lot of things that goes into organizing an event like this, and I want to also thank them for um, giving me the opportunity to host um, the last two and this MM Talks. Thank you so much. Um, it's so exciting for me, and um, I really hope that you guys did hear us out when um, um, we talked about uh, the podcast that um, will be coming soon. Yeah, um, um Thank you to Kiki, Alex, Kiki, and the team um, for giving us this space. And um, yeah, we'll be. This has been live recorded, so we're gonna publish this on the Kiki platform. And um, yeah, so you guys uh, watch out for it. Um, yeah. So thank you, Ruby. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Leon. And thank you to Austin. You guys shared amazing stories, and uh, you gave us gems on gems. So thank you so much. Um, let's give up for that. All right, it's been a great night. Thanks, everyone, for coming. I hope that you guys keep it locked in with Mixtape Madness um, and have a great night. <laughs>